Welcome to One on One. My guest on the program is Sergeant Basi Osage. Sergeant Basi Osage attended York University, Toronto, Canada, and graduated with a bachelor's degree in business administration in 1999. Bassi joined the Toronto Police Service in June 1998 as a court officer assigned to the Ontario Superior Court as a member of the security team for judges, crown prosecutors, prisoners, and members of the public. He was hired as a police recruit in December 2000 and graduated from the Ontario Police College in April 2001. He was later elevated to fourth class police constable in May 2001 and then first class police constable in 2004. He was then assigned to 32 division where he served in the primary response unit, alternative response unit, community response unit, divisional warrant officer, detective constable in the major crime unit and the criminal investigation bureau. He has also served in the street violence task force Toronto Anti-Violence Intervention Strategy, Human Resources Management, and as a detective in the Elite Homicide Squad. He was promoted to the rank of Sergeant Detective in 2011, making him the highest ranking Nigerian bond police officer with the Toronto Police Service. He is a recipient of the 2015 Black History Month Community Award. He is also a seasoned expert in community policing with over 20 years of policing experience in different areas. Basi Osage is the president and chief executive officer of Uhi Security Services Limited, an innovative security company. Welcome, my guest, Sergeant Basi Osage. Good day. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Oh, such an awesome curriculum, Vite Yamose. Thank you. Yeah, you're doing quite a lot. And I, I think what got my attention to get you invited to have this discussion was to see a police officer, you know, encouraging people to get involved in the NSAS protest. What exactly necessitated that? Uh, I, I, I've listened to some of your interviews, but maybe for the benefit of those who probably haven't heard you, what really pushed you to say that? Yeah, what happened was that I uh, received a call from uh, a community member in Toronto about her having to organize a protest, and they did not earlier get a permit to organize that protest. So I, uh, I was officer, uh, officer at the, the station at the time, but I drove on the road to, the, uh, to meet them and help them to make sure the protest is being organized. And the reason is that the police system in Nigeria, from colonial era, nobody had done anything to improve on it. So because of that, and the notorious squad, the, uh, the, the SARS uh, notorious squad, the, 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 the behavior has been very brutal to our people. And although I believe that ending a SARS was not a solution to the police uh, problem in Nigeria, but I believe that was the beginning of it. Okay, just uh, to put to it on the awareness. Just to put it on record, uh, how many years did you stay here in Nigeria? Probably uh, to appreciate the kind of situation we face here. Well, well I, uh, I left Nigeria when I was about 19 years old. And uh, since I left Nigeria, uh, and I started coming back to Nigeria since around 98, and I have returned to Nigeria almost every year awesome. since 1998. Now, uh, without boring you, some of the things that led to the formation of SARS was, uh, uh, was said to be the peculiar situation we were facing. But uh, do you have such kind of unit in Canada, and what kind of model was used, you know, to cop such uh, okay. extreme criminalities. Yeah, the, the, the way we do it is this. We have uh, what we call gang task force. When I was a young officer, I used to be a member of a gang task force. So what, what, what you do, the way SAS is supposed to be, is you do the investigation. You, it's, it's what we call intelligent policing. So the reason is because you don't want to cast a net to, uh, to the crowd and you start asking every young man, to ask for their phone, that's not effective. So what the, the, the kind of unit we have is, you do investigation, you do surveillance on the bad guys, and you follow them. And what that unit is supposed to do is to then identify a particular target, what we call like a subject, like someone, like a bad guy, and then 
follow them plain clothes or even uniform, but undercover, and then have a uniform officer make that stop. The only time a SARS officer is supposed to be seen, in our case, is when they are ready to make the arrest. What you see, probably seen a movie, we go, we identify the suspect, we, uh, we locate the vehicle, we buzz them in, then we jump out of the car with police uh, uniform uh, or just a vest or a sign that says we're police. We make the arrest, then we're out. Then the uniform guys stay and uh, so you know it's, it's sad like our our team don't go on one on one with people on the street. We we use intelligent led policing to uh, get our suspect. We identify them. We follow them and then we make a stop. So the idea of having SARS on the road, in my opinion, was just a task, almost like tax collection. They were just collecting money, abusing people, and I, and I hold the leadership accountable for that. So when I saw the NSAS uh, going on. I, my, my question was, who is the head of SARS? Who is the team leader? I am, when I'm on the road in Toronto, I am a, the road boss. I'm responsible for my people. So the, some SARS on the road, there should be a commander in every state. So those are the people that should be held accountable. And you have a commander at the uh, DIG leading to. I, I think this is, uh, uh, pardon to use my language, this is more of a Nigerian problem. Even we have this kind of issues when it comes to uh, uh, graft, where we see s no diligent investigation has been done, the parade of suspects, and they end up losing the case. But, and that brings me to some of the narrations, some of the deliberations we are having. Police is talking about SWAT. I'm sure you've heard about that. Yes. And that s sounds like what you're talking about. Do you think that will work, or you think it's one of those uh, lip services? Right now, I... I, I don't want to offend anybody, but I got to say the truth. The present leadership of the Nigerian police cannot effectively have a tax force like that. Because I believe the leadership don't have the conviction. They don't have the uh, discretionary power. And they don't have the, uh, the experience, the training to have a tax force that can actually get the job done. For you to have a tax force like that, remember the tax force is going to be picked from the existing police force. That's true. And I don't believe the, our officers are competent enough to do what we're asking them to do. So for us to have a competent SWAT team, you need to, uh, I, I would say, radically change the Nigerian police. That means we have to go back. You may have to open this matter what you have now. You have to go back. How do you hire your people? We hire people. You can't get into the police force in Nigeria unless you know a chief or you know a House of Rep member. If you, if you don't have that, you got to bribe somebody. I, I'm hearing you pay about 100,000 uh, 100, naira hmm. to get on. So then what that gives you, you don't have competent, qualified people to get in. Then when you get in, they don't have the right training. Before I got hired as a police officer, the recruiting officer, they go by my neighbors. They go to people, schools, and ask, what is his character? The first question they ask you on the interview is, why do you want to become a police officer? What have you done? to deserve that position. So if you have never do volunteer job, and you have never worked in the community, then you haven't done anything to qualify to be a police officer. Are we asking that from our people? I don't think so. They talk about the training. How are they trained? And this idea of Nigeria where, because you have a university degree, they jump you to ASP, or whatever they call it. For us, once you are recruited, I had a business degree before I joined the job. You have to start from the recruits. What that, the disadvantage of the way Nigeria does it is that when you get a guy who went to university, he's a law, lawyer, join the police, then get ASP. From ASP, probably attached to some uh, office, they become uh, superintendent, superintendent, become deputy, and become, become uh, commissioner of police. CP. He's, not, he's not a real policeman. You know why? He did not start from the ground. Okay, so Jim Bassi, so, so, let, let me so, let, to let me finish. Yeah, okay. so, so, I'm going I'm okay. to allow you to uh, talk more on that. Okay. We're going to talk more on the training and retraining. We're going to talk about the issue of mercenaries. Okay. We're going to talk about the, re the remuneration of these police okay. officers in okay. our next segment. Okay. So what I want, let's take a short break. We'll be back. I still have Sergeant Bassi with me here in the studio. Please don't go anywhere. Welcome back. It's still one-on-one. I have Sergeant Bassi, who is a detective 
with the Canadian police and has been talking to us about the police force in Nigeria, how they can be trained and retrained so that we can have a better uh, police reform. Yeah, you were just talking about um, the kind of training that you expect. And uh, I was shocked to hear that uh, we have to go straight to the head for us to make headway. What exactly is now the way forward? Are you saying we should disband the police force entirely so that we can have a total overhaul? And how should that be done? My, my belief is that the present leadership, just because of the way they, they, uh, they groom the leadership in the, uh, the Nigerian police, is not competent enough. The people, people will argue with you and say, well, they all have master's degree, they have PhD. What I told a friend of mine the other day was that if they were really doing police job, they wouldn't have time to have PhD in psychology. Mm. Because being a police officer is not just a job. It's a way of life. You got to be entrenched in it in order to do a good job. So leave education out of it. Education is basic, is to give you the background. But what I'm saying is that, yes, I believe that we need to, like what I call, we have to poof the, uh, the Nigerian police and kind of reorganize it. Even the ranking system is bad. My, my solution, uh, if, if I was the IG, is to uh, reorganize it. Maybe 80% maybe of them will be gone. And we have people who have done the youth service for the past five years. I will call them up, train them for like six months, and start a total overhaul of the police force. The other thing, the problem is that you may not be able to do that because the politicians benefit from the inefficiency and effectiveness of the police. Wow. So they cannot allow police to be efficient and effective because it will cut into their benefit. So that is why it's like you are asking a thief to help you look for your money. Someone stole your money. It's, it's like that because the politicians will benefit from the bad system. Because if you have a police service that's like Toronto, that means there cannot be questions. That means they don't have a police, a police force that paid probably more than them. How? You it's mean that is possible for policemen to be paid more than the politician? Yes. That sounds quite uh, our, our chief unusual. Of, our chief of police make more than our mayor. And our mayor of the city of Toronto have control over billions of dollars. But the chief of police make more. Uh, someone of my rank make more than a councillor. Hmm. So that is one of the ways to, to hold police back. Because once you police start making the same money and you promote them, then they have control, have discretions. And that way they will not have to suck up to the politicians. Politicians I'm quite this. interested in this, and that's, for me, it's the, it's the irony we see here. The police force that is being fought for in this protest have ended up turning against the protesters because they feel the reform that is being asked for, I, I don't understand their psyche, for them not to support the protesters. And the politicians seem, like you said, you know, gaining from this. So how do you give them this orientation to know that they deserve more than the politicians that they protect. Because this is over. And don't also forget, we have an average of 300,000 police officers yes, but across the, the country. Yeah, but, but the numbers is not the problem because we also have the population. So the thing is that police have been dis dismantled. They don't have the, 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 the moral values for themselves. It's not there. They are not dedicated. And they don't, people don't have faith in them. So they are frustrated. So the frustration became negative towards the people because a lot of them have called me and said, what can we do? So what I tell them is that police have to know their job in protest. A lot of these officers don't know. Your job as a police officer is a complete neutrality in a protest. You are neither on the side of the government, nor, the, uh, nor you are on the side of the people. Of the mm -hmm. you, you are to maintain peace. The only time you step in when there's a breach of law, breach of order and then you have to rest up. So what happened is misinformation on both sides. The police are helpless. They're under the control of the politicians. One, and like we talk about, the pay. Police officer get assigned to a governor. The governor gave him extra 10,000 a month. <laughs> and that is where his bread is buttered. So when the citizens are protesting, he doesn't see the benefit. Plus he doesn't have faith in the system either. He doesn't think that your protest is going to yield any positive things. Wow. So he's not, he doesn't have faith in your protest. So he's not going to support you. If the police are paid well and they know 
that the, the protest is going to yield positive for them. Then they, will, then they will support the protest. But right now, they have no faith in the system. And they are frustrated. And so many things is happening to them. So they don't want to be against the people. But it looks like they are going to where their bread is buttered. The little change they are getting in addition to their salary. I, I don't think the police are really against the protest, against the people. It's just misinformation. Okay, I'm, I'm okay. Let, let's also look at something you mentioned that has to do with community policing, where you have a whole lot of experience there. This is also a part of the conversation, but it appears uh, the Constitution definitely does not support that, and we are yet to get that competition rejigged. How does poli uh, community policing work over there in Canada, and if there's anything we can learn? So the first of all, what I would say is this, and I bet anyone to challenge me, Community policing, as been, I see on the news, I've been practiced in Nigeria, is not community policing. So I don't know where to get the idea from. When you set up a moteco, or like the one we do in Benin, that is not community policing. You are just setting another parasitas, military parasitas, to do the same job that police are supposed to do. But they are no more than glorified security guard. That's the moteco now? Yes. And I can ask them to challenge me, what is supposed to be? What is community policing? Community policing is not a program. It's a philosophy. It's a strategy. If you go back to Robert Peel, uh, principle of policing, the primary mission, why police exist, is to prevent crime and disorder. Community policing is a strategy of policing where you proactively prevent crime not to be reactive. Because I remember when I joined the police, one of my boss told me, he said, by the time you start arresting people, you have failed in your job as a police officer. Hmm. Because your job is to prevent crime. So community policing is a strategy where you form partnership with the people. You work with the people, you collaborate with the people in order to ensure their well-being. If people are afraid of crime, or they fear that there will be crime, then their well-being is affected, and they will not be happy. OK, so Jambasi, let's break it down, because this looks like a theory for those proponents of Amorteku. Now, they will remind us that for the core officers, we have them localized. They know the terrain. They know all the corners within that community Unlike what we have now, where the commission of police is probably not from that state, where a whole lot of DPUs are yeah. not even from yeah. that so, region. Yeah, yeah. I, I, understand what you, I understand that part. You see, they understand it, Terry. But because the, the community policy is not properly done, the way it's supposed to be is that you, you let the police do what a Monteco is supposed to do. You have a section of the police. Because you know what happened? You have a Monteco on the, on the street. But they don't have the authority. They don't have the discretion. They, they know the terrain, but they don't have the power like the police. So, but you have to let police officers do that job. What's supposed to happen is that every police station in that area should have a department, a section, that is called Community uh, Police and Response Unit. Those are the ones that will then go in the community for partnership. And with they the should people. be natives of that area? Yeah, yeah. That, 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 is, that is very important. Another problem, that's a separate problem. Another problem with the Nigerian is that you have somebody trained in Kaduna and he's from Sokoto. You send him to Benin to be a police officer. This is useless. He's not going to be effective. He doesn't speak the language. He doesn't know the people. He doesn't know the area. And the people don't trust him. So you set him out to fail. That's a big problem. The second problem is you have to know what you're doing. If, if you don't have the strategy, then those Omoteku guys you have don't have the power. They can go to the community and talk to them, and then who did they talk to after? Okay. You have somebody who have the ear of the commissioner. That is the DPO of that station, who's supposed to oversee the, the community policing of that area. Good. Not a separate organization. Uh, once again, I may have to quickly interject you. But you know what? It's not over yet. Let's quickly go on a short break, and when we come back, it will be time to go on a home drive where we'll look at the solution, purely on the solution to this police decadence that we have in our country. We'll be back after this short break. Please don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back. It's to 101, and I have Sergeant uh, Bassi all the way from Canada, but he's currently here in Nigeria to see how we can get it right in our policing system. But let me take you a bit away from police and look at security generally. Now, there is a conversation ongoing, and that has to do with um, deployment of mercenaries. Uh, let's have mercenaries help us solve the problem of insurgency. What is your opinion on this? Some believe that her problem should be solved internally rather than going out. When, when you say mercenary, you mean bringing people from abroad to do it? Depending on the context. Some the said context. you can even get Mercen some mercenaries within the country. For me, by the time you go into bringing mercenary in, you have almost admitted that you failed. And uh, the army or the police are the legal authority, not the mercenary. If the legal, people with legal authority to maintain peace cannot maintain peace, then mercenary is going to do it. Then you're going to fail. But isn't that the reality? That, that is the reality on ground. But what the government should be thinking is how to improve on their military training or the equipment they need to have. But the, 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 that, that is a, a bigger issue because what, what in the military is going on in the military is the same thing that's going on with the police. Our military officers, they are dedicated, they are, they are, they are good, and they, they mean well, but they don't get paid well. They don't have the necessary equipment. And they don't have faith in the system anymore. So they cannot get the job done. So what needs to be done is, like, just like the police, the head, obviously they are not competent. The thing is that we glorify uh, injustice. And when the head cannot get a job, you replace them. If you cannot get an expert, we have Nigerians who are corner, major generals in U.S. military, in Canadian military. Why don't we invite them to look into our system and then... That way, help us run the organization because they will be able to have the trust from the U.S. U.S. will not trust, or Canada will not trust our military officer because they don't trust their information will be safe with them. Hmm. So because of that, you need to have some, some of us who are probably from abroad who is trusted, who will not betray the trust, who, are, who have integrity. To really, I'm not saying our people don't have integrity. I don't know those military officers. But... The best way to do it is to have the military go on. If you have to hire outsiders, you may have to re re request the U.S. Army or the Canadian Army. Missionaries are not going to be able to do it because they don't understand it. They're just going to cause more havoc. Our people will not accept them. Even what, what happened after they, they, uh, they leave? What after, after they leave? What's our plan? That, 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 brings, me, and that brings me to the next question, the issue of... Either knowledge transfer by way of training, let's take some of our officers out there and uh, let them train them, or let's have those people come down. But over time, we've had reports of, instead of allowing junior officers to go for this training, these senior officers get to go for the training just for their pecuniary gain of extra codes and the rest. So how do we correct this uh, menace? That's Part of the problem. I have been involved where people call me and say this, or oh, they want to train in the Nigerian, in the Toronto police. Can you help us? First question I ask, who is coming for the training? It doesn't make sense you want to it's train a SWAT team. You cannot send a commissioner to train a SWAT team. You need to send the team lead. That's the constable who's going to be leading the team or a sergeant. That's who you send to get the training. Or when you bring them. So in a Nigerian situation, sending them abroad to train is too risky. The first thing, they're not going to send the right people. And if you send the junior guys, they will go, they won't return. Hmm. So the best thing to do is to bring the training here. Hmm. To do it, or you can sublet it. Like our situation is, is an like emergency situation. So there's no room for training. What should happen? Maybe you get the uh, services of the U.S., Canada, to help you do the bombardment or the, the, like, like the raid of this military uh, a pocket, Pockets. or the Boko Haram pocket. Get get the raid going. A special uh, a weapon unit. Get it get it subdued. Then you can take in our people that are now trained by our, by foreign uh, police or foreign uh, military to go in and then what we call community mobilization because you have to then mobilize the people to support the people that are moving in. Our people is not going to trust mercenaries. They don't even trust our police. So, but we need to go there, let police start building their integrity. Let police start showing to the, our people that they care about them. 
Because we, police cannot do their job without the people's support. Okay. And one other thing that is very, very paramount in these whole engagements is the issue of remuneration. In clear terms, I know I am not being pessimistic. Nigerians can hardly pay what Canadian government is paying their police officers. But what do you think it's sizable amount that should be the minimum wage for the police officers? Because this current administration had done that once, but even then, the full implementation was yet to take place. So what would you recommend? I, I think that, I, not that I think, I believe that our government, our leadership, uh, they are not serious about reforming the police. Because it doesn't take more than f two minutes for the president to make an executive order to say, I believe the minimum any constable should make should be about 100,000 naira a month. We start with that. And then you, you progress. There's, there should be no way why a uh, House of Rep member should make more than a commissioner of police. Because hmm. what's going on is that you have the House of Rep member make millions. So it's not that we don't get the money. We have the money. The, the, the people can cut the budget of the, say, House of Rep by 50% and say, we're going to use that 50% to pay for the police for the next three years. But they are being protected by police. And so why would they want to deprive themselves of that? And you hear the IG said no more prote protection of the VIP. The IG cannot enforce it because the IG depends on those politicians to keep his job. To keep his job. So the IG tenure should be term limited. It should be five years, you get a job. That way he's not afraid to make changes. But the IG cannot make both change because when the president sneezes, the IG is here to say, excuse me. Because mm -hmm. his job depends on the politicians. So, but we need to appoint a competent inspector general of police. You don't have to be from the police, from the rank and file. We have to look around the country. And maybe that aspect of the constitution has to change. That has to come from within the police force. Because I don't believe there's someone in the Nigerian police right now who is competent to lead us and put our police force in where we want it to be. Our people are too civilized and too sophisticated for what we have. I don't believe the present leadership can provide it. So they all look, look elsewhere and get someone who is competent, who can get the job done, and give that person a term limit, say four years, five years. Make it five years to, so that they can outlast two administration. That way, they have more discretion to make decisions. They'll be able to, okay. to do things. Thank you so much, Sergeant Detective Bassi Osage, for your time. And uh, it's quite insightful, some of the things we've shared. We sincerely hope that uh, lessons are learned and things will be done rightly. The protest will be peaceful and the aim will be achieved in coming days. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And this is Alpha to wrap it up on 101. 101 comes up another time with an interesting topic. This is where we say bye for now. I am Coyote Ladeindee.